Today in our study of the Gospel of Luke, we come to another miracle of healing. Jesus was healing people who were afflicted. It's the healing of the paralytic, so-called. And we last saw Jesus cleanse the leper. The man was full of leprosy. Leprosy was a picture of uncleanliness of sin. But today the paralytic is a picture of the paralysis of sin. So sin not only pollutes us, it cripples us. So the two healings are complementary. He cleansed the leper because sin is a defilement, and then he heals the paralytic, and sin cripples us and keeps us from walking in the ways of the Lord. So Jesus wants to cleanse us and forgive us and empower us and enable us to walk in his ways. Now, in this text, we learn that Jesus is God. There's a multitude of lessons, by the way, that we learn in this study And I cannot exhaust them all or even touch them all, but we clearly see the deity of Jesus shining through and his authority to forgive sin. So Jesus is God, and Jesus is able and has the authority to forgive sins. And we also see that he has the power to give us to walk in the ways that are pleasing to him. Now, I want to take this text, I want to consider it, and the eyes of Jesus as he looked around at what did he see at this miracle. So we're going to be looking at the story through the eyes of Jesus. He's going to look in three different directions if you're taking notes. Jesus first looked up and saw the four persistent men or friends. So he looked up and he saw their faith. And this is in verses 17 to the very first half of verse 20. Let's read it. Beginning in verse 17, Luke says, It came to pass that on a certain day that as he was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law. We're going to find out that they are scribes sitting by which came out of every town in Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Notice that the power of God in this packed out house was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed, a man which had been taken with palsy. He was a paralytic or crippled. And they sought by means to bring him in and they lay and lay him before Jesus. But when they could not, verse 19, find a way by which they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went up upon the housetop. They let him down through the tiling in a couch in the midst before Jesus. And when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. Now I want to stop right there in verse 20. The story is also recorded for us, if you're taking notes, in Matthew 9 and in Mark chapter 2. So it's a synoptic story that's found in Matthew, Mark, and in Luke. Now, Mark chapter 2, he tells us where the story took place. It did take place in Capernaum. Now, Capernaum is on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee. It became the headquarters of Jesus' Galilean ministry and operation, and it was the home of Peter, James, John, and Andrew. So some feel that the miracle happened in Peter's house. We don't know that to be a fact because the Bible doesn't say. Some scholars believe that it might have been in the synagogue, but it was in a house or a building where they tore off the roof and they lowered down this lame man before Jesus as he was teaching and preaching. So the other Gospels also tell us that not only was Jesus teaching, but that Jesus was preaching. And Mark chapter 2 tells us there were many gathered together, so there was no room for the press that was there, the crowd. Now, you can go back with me to verse 17. He was teaching, there were Pharisees and doctors of the law. Wanted to point that out because this is the first time in Luke's gospel that Pharisees are mentioned. Now, the doctors of the law, we learn in verse 21, are scribes. Now, what are the Pharisees and what are the scribes? By by the way, just a little kind of big picture here. All the way up to the end of chapter 6 in Matthew's or Luke's gospel, we start seeing the conflict between Jesus and the religious establishment. And that's going to be led by the Pharisees. 
So they're mentioned all the way through this section of Luke as they come into conflict, and then it culminates with them crucifying Jesus by turning him over to the Romans and having him crucified. But a Pharisee, the word Pharisee literally means separate ones or separated ones. And as a result of the Babylonian captivity, they came back, and this Jewish sect, it was a Jewish sect of individuals, men, who gave themselves to nothing but keeping every jot and tittle of the law. Now, they became synonymous with hypocrisy only because they were so devoted to the law that they actually were so picky about all their rules and regulations that they became legalistic. They didn't even keep all of their own rules, and they looked down and despised others who didn't keep their standards. Today, you might call somebody who's a legalist a Pharisee based on their picture in the scriptures. That doesn't mean every one of them were hypocrite. Many of them may be sincere, but they were also, as a group, kind of opposing Christ and coming against him. Then the scribes, mentioned as doctors of the law, they were the theologians. They studied the scriptures, they translated the scriptures, and they wrote their commentary on the scriptures. And then the Pharisees, they came in and they tried to do all that the scribes had told them to do. So this religious establishment of the Jews is there in Capernaum in this crowded house when Jesus was there teaching and preaching and the power of the Lord was present to heal. Now in verse 18, behold or look, men. Now Luke doesn't tell us, but the other gospels tell us that there were four of them. First service, I'm like this, four of them. And then I looked at my hand and go, no, there's four of them. It's not easy being a preacher. And they're famous four guys. They're, they're famous because they brought their friend who needed to be healed and forgiven to Jesus, the only hope. They're a reminder to us that we should bring our lame, spiritually lame unable to walk in the ways of the Lord, needing Christ, bring them to Jesus so that he can forgive them and heal them. Amen? So thank God. When I get to heaven, I want to meet these four guys. I want to find out what their names were, find out what they were thinking when they tore the roof up. And I want to meet them and shake their hands. So they come to this house. It's packed out. There's no way they can even get near the house. So they evidently went up on the roof, verse 19. Now, in those days, the roofs were all flat, which I think kind of makes good sense because you could put a patio on top of the roof, and there would be stairs on the outside of the house. So they got through the crowd somehow, got to the stairs, went up on the roof, and they started tearing up the roof and lowering people down. Years ago, the church I previously pastored, Calvary Chapel, San Bernardino started in the home. By the way, this week we celebrate 50 years at the church in San Bernardino of ministry. And what a glorious thing that is. But we used to get almost 100 people in the living room. We would pick, we would open the windows and they would sit outside on the grass listening through the windows as I taught the Bible. They were down the hallway, they were in the kitchen, they were on the counter, they were in the bedroom, they were on the back of the couch. They were in the bathroom. I won't tell you where they sat there. <laughs> Perfect place to sit. And they were just packing out this house. And it reminds me of this story, just the energy, the power, the presence of the Lord. And we would just gather and worship and pray and study God's word. And so these friends show up. And how are we going to get through the crowd? I would have said, forget it. It's too crowded. Let's go home. It isn't going to happen. But these four men, we're going to look at them in just a moment, had determination, faith, and confidence, and love to motivate them to get them to Jesus. So they go up on the roof. They tear up the roof. Now, if it is Peter's house, he's probably freaking out. Like somebody's going to have to pay for this. He's probably already calling his insurance adjuster. Get over here right away. Need your help. And as Jesus is preaching, all this debris began to fall. Now, I've preached for a long time, and I've had many interruptions. But never anybody break through the roof to get into the Bible study. 
When I was in the Philippines years ago, I'll never forget, first time in the Philippines, I was in this jungle church preaching, and up on the stage, and I'm preaching, and coming down, in the middle of my sermon, right down the center, I was this great big dog, Filipino dog. It walked right down, stood right and just looked at me while I was preaching. And just stood there. And then it started walking back and forth. And I'm thinking, where are the dog ushers around here? <laughs> Never got rid of the dog. The whole sermon, the dude's just walking around looking at me. I thought, this sermon's gone to the dogs. <laughs> but I'll never forget that interruption. It was amazing. Now, Jesus, no doubt, wasn't bothered, wasn't disturbed. I believe that Jesus had a big smile on his face and he had all the debris still in his hair. The dust was in the room. And he's, we're going to see, was so pleased at the faith of these four and also the paralytic as they lowered their friend down. So they could not find the way by which they might bring him in because of the crowd, the multitude. So they went up on the house top, verse 19, let him down through the tiling with his couch unto the midst before Jesus. So either they tied ropes to the four corners or they tied their clothes, but they lowered this man down. And look at the first part of verse 20. And when Jesus saw what? Their faith. You can see real faith because faith goes into action. Faith works. If your faith does not manifest itself in works, it's not a real, authentic genuine faith. Now, some lessons we learn from these, these individuals, these four men or friends, Jesus saw their faith. So they had number one, write it down. They had love for their love for their friend because they, he needed a healing and needed forgiveness. They overcame great obstacles. Someone said they vandalized another's property to achieve their end. I love that. They were willing to shred the roof of this house that they wanted so bad because they loved their friend so much to get him to Jesus. How much do you love the lost? How much do you love your family, your friends, your co-workers? You ever invite them to church? You ever share the gospel with them? You ever tell them about Jesus? We should be busy bringing our lost, lame friends to Jesus. They also had conviction, or what we would say hope, coupled with their love for their friend, was their conviction that Jesus was the only hope. Why go to Jesus? Because only Jesus can forgive sins. And only Jesus can heal the paralyzed lame man. So Jesus was their only hope. In Acts chapter 4, verse 20, or verse 12, the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved than the name of Jesus. Amen? It means Jesus is our only hope. So we need to love our lost friends. We need to seek to bring them to Jesus that they might be forgiven and saved. And they also had faith. So they had faith, they had hope, and they had love. Notice again in verse 20, he saw their faith. Now, whose faith did Jesus see? Well, obviously the faith of the four men, the four friends. They had enough faith to tear the roof off. They had enough faith to go through the crowd. They had enough faith to lower down their friend to Jesus. So Jesus looking up saw their faith. Now, I picture Jesus in this room kind of dark. They didn't have lights or electricity in those days and very few windows. And then when the roof was ceiling was opened up to the roof, all this light came in. And I imagine that all four of these guys laying on the roof stuck their faces over the hole. What a picture. Gnarly picture. Dust all over them, smiling, looking down. Jesus looked at them. He didn't get upset with them. He didn't rebuke them. He didn't get mad at them. He didn't say, get off the roof. You just interrupted my exposition of Scripture, which I would have done. So don't anyone move. He was smiling. If I were doing a movie of this story, Jesus would have drywall dust all over him with a big smile on his face. Because he saw their love. He saw their conviction. 
and he saw their faith, and I believe it also includes the faith of the paralytic. I've kind of changed my view of this story as I studied it again this week. I believe the paralytic had a yearning and a longing to be forgiven. I used to think he might have been disappointed when Jesus said, your sins are forgiven you rather than rise up and walk. But I do believe he wanted forgiveness and he had faith and Jesus saw his heart. And Jesus knew that he had to fix his sin problem before he could fix his crippled problem. His problem was his heart. It wasn't his legs. So Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the four, and I would also include the faith of the paralytic. Their faith was persistent. It didn't give up. I would have given up. Their faith was creative. They tore off the roof. Now that's a creative way to get people to Jesus. Their faith was sacrificial. It cost them. Who paid for the repairs? Who paid for the roof? Someone said these four men understood what was important. I like that. Too many Christians are more interested in the place of worship rather than the people, or the loveliness of the service rather than the lostness of the sinner. That's good. We're worried about no interruptions, everything has to be right, my comfortable pew and my comfortable church, my comfortable fellowship with my comfortable donuts and Christian coffee, sanctified coffee. It's Hebrew, it's Hebrew coffee. <laughs> I'll stop right there. Or when you go to a restaurant after church service, you ask for a sanctified section. And you ask for a Holy Spirit filled waiter or waitress, because you don't want to get cooties. Everything is sterile. We don't want to tear up a roof. We don't want to get dust on us. We don't want to be inconvenienced. We don't want to bother bringing someone to church. They might, they might take up too much room in our car, or cost too much gas, or eat too much food, or I don't know what. We, might, we have all our reasons why I can't invite my friends, I can't invite my family, I can't invite my employer to come to church with me or come to Christ. They had so much love, so much conviction or hope, and so much faith that they would do anything to get their friend to Jesus. You know, it reminds me of the Jesus movement of the 60s when Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa was just starting and all the hippies were coming to church. I was one of those hippies. And they just put new carpet in the church and the hippies were coming barefoot. And some of the established people in the church felt that the bare feet would be detrimental and damage the carpet. So someone took it upon themselves to put a sign in the foyer, no bare feet allowed. Well, Pastor Chuck Smith saw that sign. He took it down, met with the church. He said, if we can't let the hippies in because of the carpet, then we'll tear out the carpet and let the hippies come in. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's like tearing off the roof. Let's tear out the carpet if the hippies are going to come. They used to sit all over the floor. They would sit in the pews. They would run their bare toes through the holes of the communion containers. <laughs> and people, oh, that's the abomination of desolation <laughs> spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Freaking out. I remember people used to ask me, when are you going to cut your hair? Why do you look like a hippie? Why do you look like that? When are you, when are you, when are you going to look like a Christian? I thought, I look more like Jesus than you do. <laughs> what are you talking about? God looks at the heart, amen? We need to look at the heart. So let's get radical. Let's tear the roof off if we need to, to get sinners to hear the good news about Jesus Christ and take the gospel, as it were, to the streets. I love Jerry Vine's old Baptist preacher that gave names to these four men. He called the first man Frank Faith. He believed Jesus could heal. Second man was called Harry Hope. He believed Jesus would heal. Third man was called Larry Love. He said, I love you. Won't you come to Jesus? And the fourth man was Dan Determination. He said, let's not quit. 
Let's get you to Jesus. I like that. These are the kind of people we need in our church. Amen? So let's be people who care about the lost and seek to bring others to Jesus. Now, not only did Jesus look up, verses 1 to the first part of verse 20, but then Jesus looked down and saw the paralyzed man. Look at verse 20 again. And when he saw their faith, he, that is Jesus, said unto him, that is the paralytic, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. What amazing statement. Now they brought him because he was lame and he could not walk. But Jesus looked not at his lameness, but at his spiritual need. And Jesus tells him, your sins are forgiven. Jesus saw not only the paralyzed legs, but he also saw the impotent man paralyzed soul. Jesus seeing this man's faith, and he made no request for forgiveness, tells the man, your sins are, not might be, not maybe, not if you're lucky, not you better hope they are. He said, your sins are forgiven. And take note of the fact that the man did not say, Jesus, please forgive me. Jesus, I believe in you. Jesus, I trust you. He just was lowered down, but Jesus knows the heart. Jesus perceived the four's faith, Jesus perceived the lame man's faith and need of forgiveness. This perception is because he is the divine son of God. Jesus knows our supreme need is that of forgiveness of sin. Now, this is a point I, I, I wish I knew how to communicate and drive home to every heart. Jesus knows our supreme need is the forgiveness of our sins. If you're here today and you're not forgiven of your sins, that's your greatest need. You go, I need a job, or I need a healing, or I need this, or I need that. Your greatest need is for forgiveness of sins. You know, the Bible says you can gain the whole world, but if you lose your soul, it profits you nothing. What good would it do for the lame man to live his life with legs, die and go to hell for all eternity if he were not forgiven of his sins. So the first and paramount supreme need of all human beings is the forgiveness of our sins. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, Jesus said something that's not recorded here by Luke. He actually said, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. That indicates the man wanted and desired and was longing for his own sin to be forgiven. Be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. And in the Jewish mind, sickness directly related to sin. So Jesus would have to heal the man to convince them that their sin had been forgiven. Alexander McLaren said the world has superficially diagnosed man's disease and is woefully wrong about the remedy. Oh, how true that is. Society treats the symptoms. Jesus came to take away the cause. I, I, when I watch the news, I get so frustrated with all the pundits and the discussion and the politics. We talk about the problems and we think it's politically answered or socially or whatever and economically. And they don't realize the problem is the heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. It's not a skin color. It's a sin problem. It's the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Someone said, the paralytic man is a picture of all men. In Adam's fall, we fell all. If you don't understand that when Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden, he brought sin, sickness, and death upon the whole human race, you'll never understand or properly diagnose man's great need. You'll be treating symptoms, and there'll be no change. If you want to change society, change men's hearts. 
People are all freaking out about how could there be a God of love who allows war in this world? God doesn't start wars and God doesn't necessarily stop wars. He can do that, but it's man's sinful heart. Until man's hearts are changed, the world lies in sin. Now, Jesus will reverse the curse. The curse of the world today came because of Adam's sin and transgression. And there's coming a future day when that will be reversed. But until then, sickness, sorrow, suffering, and war, and all these diseases are still in our world and part of our existence. But forgiveness of our sins is a great miracle. It's supernatural. Only God can forgive sins. It's complete. God forgives all of our sins. It's certain. Notice verse 20. Are forgiven. I've underlined and circled that little word are there. Not might, might be, but your sins are. That's the certainty. And this pronouncement, your sins are forgiven, is permanent. In the Greek, it's in what's called the perfect tense. Perfect tense means that it happened in the past and it has effect on in the present and out into the future. It's permanent. It won't change. Forgiveness meets our greatest need because it costs the greatest price, the cross of Christ, and it brings the greatest blessing, forgiveness of sin and fellowship with God. You know what God had to do to forgive our sins? He had to send His Son, Jesus Christ, from heaven to die on the cross, the God-man, the perfect man, God in flesh, to die for our sins. He had to be man to die, he had to be God to forgive us and save us. But there's a third direction Jesus looked. He looked up, saw the persistent man. He looked, he looked down, saw the paralyzed man. But then thirdly, Jesus looked around and perceived the hard hearts of the scribes and the Pharisees. Let's finish our story, verse 21 to 26. So the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason Saying Now notice they weren't verbalizing this. They were just thinking this in their minds. Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Now take note of these question marks. Who is this man think he is? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Question mark. But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, verse 22, he answered and said unto them, What reason ye... In your hearts, Jesus asked the question, whether is it easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say rise up and walk? Question mark. But that you may know that the Son of Man, first time he uses that title, hath power upon earth to forgive sins. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto you, rise and take up thy couch, go into thy house. And notice verse 25, immediately he rose up before them, took up that wherein he lay, departed to his own house, glorifying God. And everyone that was there were amazed, which means blown away or outside of themselves, just blown away. They glorified God. They were filled with fear. And they said, we have seen strange things today. You betcha. They had. They were just kind of blown away and they glorified God and said, this is really radical. This is so strange. Now, there's again so many lessons that we cannot touch them all, but I want to point out there are more than one miracle in this story. First of all, there's the miracle of perception. Jesus perceiving faith in the four man and in the paralytic. Jesus perceiving the need for forgiveness of sins in the paralytic, and Jesus now perceiving the thoughts of the scribes and the Pharisees, verse 21 to verse 23. Did you know they didn't verbalize their questions? Why, this man, they're thinking, they're just thinking in their mind, this man speaks blasphemy. Now, if Jesus were not God, that's true. To usurp yourself in the place of a prerogative only reserved for God 
is blasphemy. And then they reason truthfully, for who can forgive sins but God alone? They're thinking this in their mind. They didn't say anything, but Jesus knew their thoughts. He read their thoughts. Did you know that Jesus knows what you're thinking right now? You're busted. I'm glad I don't know what you're thinking. And you can be really glad you don't know what I'm thinking. But Jesus knows what I'm thinking. Jesus knows what you're thinking. You know, the Bible says all things are naked and open before the eyes of him from whom we have to do. You can fool your husband. You can fool your wife. You can fool your friends. But you can't fool God. He sees. He knows. This is either scary and frightening and convicting if your heart is not right with God, if you're playing games with God, or if you're sincere, but you're stumbling and falling and you love the Lord, He sees your heart. He knows your heart. He understands. But I'm thankful that God knows my heart. But Jesus read their thoughts. And Jesus says, what is easier to say? Verse 23. Thy sins be forgiven thee? Or to say, rise up and walk. Now, there's a lot of things can be said again about this statement, but Jesus asked two questions to their two questions, or three questions. Jesus asked two questions, they asked two questions. What's easier to say, your sins be forgiven thee? Or to rise up and walk? Now, Jesus was intending to convey, it's easier to say, your sins be are forgiven. You know why? Because it's unverifiable. You can't verify it. When Jesus said, oh, your sins are forgiven you, how would anyone know that's true or not? Anyone could say that. But Jesus said that you might know that I have the authority, and the, which is the power, and the ability, and the right to forgive sins. He then turned to the lame man. He says, get up, Roll up your bed and go home. And the man immediately stood up, rolled up his bed, gave Jesus a thank you handshake. It's not in the text. I just see it there. It's in the white space. And then again, it says he went home glorifying God. I'll bet you he was walking and leaping and praising God. When you haven't walked your whole life and Jesus heals your legs, guess what you do? You put them to good use. You jump and jump and leap and walk, right? So he's walking and leaping and praising God all the way home with this bed that he no longer needed to be transported. That's a marvelous, marvelous picture. So what's Jesus saying? I am God. I have the authority to heal, and he healed the man he needed. So the power of God was there to heal. So the miracle of perception turned into the miracle of power, power that proves Jesus is God, power that pictures the salvation of a sinner. You got that? So what a marvelous miracle Jesus now performs. The power of to forgive sin, the power to heal the lame man who went walking and leaping and glorifying God. This is a miracle of part. Now, our greatest need is for forgiveness. Don't forget that. We have a world that's freaking out for social justice, but the greatest need is for forgiveness political this and political that and political that and this and that and all the fighting and issues that are going on. Man's greatest need is for forgiveness. Because if you die in your sin, you are lost for all eternity. You can gain the world, lose your soul, profit you nothing. I really appeal to you today, if you're here and you're not forgiven, that's your greatest need. It's not to make more money, not to have a nicer house, not to have a different job, not to have a better wife. I deserve a better wife. I want a new husband. Trade this one in. 
but you need forgiveness. And the problem and your li- problems of your life, the root cause is your sinful heart. Maybe you're struggling in your marriage right now. And you're thinking, yeah, I just need a divorce. That's what I need. I need to get out of this marriage. Now you need to get heart that is right with God. Your heart, your spouse's heart. You know, when they asked Jesus about divorce, this is not in my notes, and I didn't even mention this first service. Maybe someone here needs to hear this. When they asked Jesus about divorce, Jesus said, because of the hardness of your heart, God allowed you, suffered you to put away your wife. But it was never his plan. It was never his purpose. It was never his design. God wants to forgive your heart. God wants to cleanse your heart. God wants to change your heart. God wants to give you a new heart. The Bible says, if anyone is in Christ, old things pass away. All things become brand new. God can forgive you. God can heal your marriage. Some of your problems that you're facing right now is that you need to repent of your sins. You need to come lame and broken and say, God, forgive me. God, I need you. God, cleanse me. God, help me. People come up to me all the time after service and they have this problem, that problem, this problem, the other problem. And I often inquire or pray with them that they'll give their hearts to Christ. They'll know the Lord, that they are born again, that they're forgiven of their sins. Knowing that once we get aligned properly, vertically with God, that horizontally our relationships come into play. So your greatest need today, don't forget that lesson, is for forgiveness. And then secondly, forgiveness is an exclusively divine act. Do you know that ultimately sin is against God? David said when he sinned with Bathsheba, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this great iniquity in thy sight. David was a true man of repentance, a man after God's heart. He knew that he had sinned against God. And that's the key to forgiveness, knowing that only God can forgive your sins. Wanting to get right with God, not worried about the consequences of your sin in your life, but wanting the cleansing of your sin in your heart. And then number three, and I'll close, Jesus is God, and he's willing and ready and able to forgive your sins. He can cleanse you. He can heal you and give your lame legs the ability to walk in holiness and true godliness. Let's pray.